All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Instructional Continuity Webinar Series. Today, we'll be talking through Phase 3, Operationalize the At-Home Model. My name is Brian Doran, uh, and I'm in the Office of School Programs here at TEA. I'm joined by a couple colleagues who we'll hear from later. Um, and we're excited to talk through the operationalization of the Instructional Continuity Plan. Um, so we've been working through a series of phases this week. On Monday, we talked through phase zero, which is project management. Um, Tuesday, we went through phase one, conduct a landscape analysis. Yesterday, we talked through phase two, determine the at-home instructional model. Today, we're talking about operationalizing that model. Um, and then tomorrow, we'll have another webinar about providing monitoring and support during instructional continuity. Um, We've been hosting these webinars each day this week and we'll uh, continue to host them tomorrow as well at 9 a.m. with this same Zoom link. Um, and these are also all being recorded and on posted to the Instructional Continuity website. So today we'll talk through operationalizing the at-home model. Um, and our objectives today are threefold. First is provide a general overview of the TEA Instructional Continuity Framework. Um, next, we'll review the structure and available components of all phases of that framework, all phases of that framework. Uh, and then finally, we'll do a deeper dive into the guidance and tools specifically for phase three, um, the oper operationalization of the at-home model. Um, and so to do this, well, let's go ahead and kick over to the Instructional Continuity Planning Framework webpage. Um, so bear with me as I switch screens here. All right, so um, to, to start off with the Instructional Continuity webpage to get there, um, you can navigate to that page from TEA's homepage, which is tea.texas.gov, as you'll see on my screen here. Um, and to get there, you can do it a couple ways. First is um, on this scrolling banner here on the, on the webpage, we have a coronavirus uh, section. You can click on Get Updates there, uh, and that will take you to our main coronavirus update page. Um, and uh, the other way to get here is just to type in tea.texas.gov um, coronavirus um, slash coronavirus, and that will take you to the same page as well. On this page, you'll see a variety of resources all related to uh, coronavirus and, and COVID-19 response. Um, things like closure guidance and communication resources, uh, assessment, waivers and funding, um, staff and educator issues. Um, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. One second. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So let me uh, take you back here real quick, just in case uh, that screen wasn't sharing properly. Um, so on the uh, TEA's main website, we have the scrolling banner here, coronavirus. Um, we can then see the uh, coronavirus main site here. Um, this is what I was just scrolling through. Um, and so there's a variety of resources, as I was mentioning. So the um, just general closure guidance and communication resources here. Um, we have uh, assessment uh, items, waivers and funding, staff and educator issues. We'll also reference this a bit in a, in a bit. Um, school board issues, child nutrition, um, and, and a variety of other things as well. Also, towards the top of this page, we have um, three general guidance and FAQ buckets. So instructional continuity planning, uh, SPED and special populations, and then public health resources. So this webinar fits into the instructional continuity planning. Um, and so within this series, uh, we have those five phases that we were talking about earlier. Um, so down here, we have the phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. And then phase zero, which was covered in Monday's webinar, uh, is really largely centered around this instructional continuity planning tool, this Excel document here. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take a look, I encourage you to do so. Um, and then additionally, the, the webinar um, that kind of outlines the, the resources and tools behind um, both phase zero as well as phase one and phase two, those are posted down here uh, in the instructional continuity website as well. Later today, we'll be posting um, the phase three operational, this exact webinar here as well, if you need to share it with colleagues um, or just reference a, a specific time point as well. 
Um, great. So uh, today our purpose is to talk through phase three um, to operationalize the at-home model. Um, so we're really, uh, you know, in a sequential fashion, we, we've talked through your landscape analysis. Um, you've determined uh, at this point, uh, going through the framework, uh, a district would have determined the uh, instructional model and, and monitoring. Um, and now it's down to the mechanics of how are we actually operationalizing it. So I'm going to click on phase three here. Um, this is the overall landing page for phase three. We have separated phase three into five subsections. Um, 3.1 is design at home learning schedules. 3.2 is the adapt staffing models. 3.3 is communicate the plan to stakeholders. 3.4 is provide model aligned professional development. And then 3.5 is purchase, print, and or distribute instructional materials. Um, so those five, five subsections are what we'll be talking through today um, and largely within the construct of this uh, phase three website um, webpage. And what we have here is a, a four column table. Um, this first column are guidance documents. This is kind of the, the initial here is TEA's guidance on this subject as well as um, you know what you can expect to see in the resources uh, and some key considerations for that topic that we've identified. This next column is TEA resources that we've created specific to that subsection. Um, this might look like templates or, or additional guidance, um, and we'll talk through some of those um, as, as we go through this. Um, this next column is additional resources. This is largely from external organizations um, that have put out guidance or, or templates or tools specific to that, um, that subsection. And then finally, um, perhaps the most useful, we have district created examples. Um, so we have linked out some examples to district um, options, uh, and of course there are many others out there, um, but uh, this is a great opportunity for you to kind of click through and see some examples of how other districts are looking through uh, or thinking through similar subjects. All right, so to start off, we're going to go ahead and jump into uh, phase 3.1, which is design at-home learning schedules. Um, and to do that, I am going to uh, start with the guidance document. So to get there, I would click on 3.1 Design at Home Learning Schedules here, which will take you to a guidance document. Um, and let me get that up real quick. Okay. So this will take you to the uh, Instructional Continuity Planning Guide 3.1. Um, and this uh, guidance document outlines uh, several things regar regarding at-home learning schedules. Um, and to start off with, we, we identified four key planning activities. Um, first is identify your time constraints around the existing school day. This might look like things like screen time. Uh, it might look like determining a, a synchronous or asynchronous model. Um, we also refer to this as uh, teacher-led or student-led. Um, so when we're thinking through that, um, we are identifying are all students in that class or subject is expected to be working on the same material at the same time, or is the district looking at more providing some activities uh, and um, uh, instructional options for students to be um, going through that material at, at their own pace throughout the day. Um, the next planning activity is uh, set your weekly and daily schedules. Um, for both teachers and students. Uh, and then we have develop and incorporate a progress monitoring plan by subject area and grade band into your weekly schedules. And then create a plan to track and monitor attendance. Um, some ple key planning guidance here, so some key principles. Um, one is keep it simple. Um, it comes as no surprise that uh, not everyone is going to have a trained educator at their home. So, um, Clarity and simplicity behind um, the, the schedule is, is helpful for parents and for students who are, are going through this um, and able to, to clearly identify what their sample schedule should look like as well as what their, um, you know, down to their daily tasks should look like. Next, don't recreate the wheel. Um, we've uh, linked out some resources here and you undoubtedly have, have seen some other resources yourselves. Uh, in terms of how districts are, are looking at creating master schedules and schedules overall. 
uh, for students and families. Um, and so we really encourage sharing there and, and trying not to uh, just start from scratch. Reading, um, so it's always appropriate to default to reading as a planning activity or as a planned activity. Um, and so, you know, the subtext there is making sure students have access to the appropriate text um, and then having them read as much as possible. Um, and then finally, managing your screen time, students' screen time. Um, when we're talking about screen time, we're referring to um, kind of the, the, the on-screen activities, so student-led on-screen activities as opposed to more video conferencing or social interactions where maybe a teacher is delivering instruction or you have a, a small group going um, via Zoom or something like that. Um, but there's some guidance here. Uh, we encourage you to review this. We also have it linked out within the external um, links on, under 3.1. Uh, some guiding questions. I, we have some um, four guiding questions here to think about as you're creating your, your schedule. Um, how many minutes per day should students be learning in their at-home model? Um, so we've seen a variety of, of uh, options here for districts implementing this. Um, many go by uh, subject matter. Uh, is certainly by grade band and, and making sure it's appropriate for uh, elementary versus middle versus high. Um, and uh, just looking at that, we'll see a couple examples here in a second as I click through um, some of our, our other documents within 3.1. Um, a, a second guiding question is which content enrichments are a priority for your students? Um, obviously, we've already identified a potential one for uh, literacy and, and reading. Um, but other options, um, depending on your local context, might also um, uh, be worth considering. Uh, second, given the, given the work that you've done um, in phases one and two, um, and student access to technology, materials, instructional delivery, uh, make sure that that factors into your overall schedule and, and uh, it's not just a plug and play from a, a different district that doesn't necessarily make as much sense for your, your context. Um, and then additionally, which student subgroups uh, will need differentiated activities? So, so doing your best to account for um, uh, special populations, uh, GT, at risk, ELL, et cetera, um, and making sure that those are factored into your schedule as, as best possible. Um, and then for this guidance document, we also talk through some of the resources that we'll have. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at the guidance document, but um, to look through the resources, I'm actually going to go back to the web page, um, and then we'll um, just talk through these um, a, a couple of these one by one. So, first for TEA resources, um, one of the things we've done is is there's a, a lot of examples out there from district created schedules um, as well as externally created external organization created schedules. Um, so one of the things I want to highlight is this at home learning schedules matrix. Um, and so if you click on that, that will uh, prompt you to download, um, let me, this Excel sheet. Um, and so what this does is uh, lists a, a variety of different schedules, um, the source, where it came from, uh, what it is, it links out to where we access that, uh, gives a quick description of, of why we included it on this list, and then goes into resource attributes here. Um, and so for these, we can now filter for, you know, grade level, instructional minutes per day, um, applicability for all districts. This is an extremely rough estimate of how we think this might be applicable for different districts. Um, we also have seen, of course, a variety of, of uh, tech components or, or technology inclusion for, for districts depending on their access. And so we uh, codified low tech, high tech, or hybrid. Um, and then also kind of getting to the synchronous or asynchronous models, teacher-led instruction versus student or family-led instruction, um, more platform-led instruction, that'd be things like more explicitly referencing Google Classroom, um, and then self-paced online learning resources. This next section then um, also outlines some of the key considerations for the schedule. Um, so do they factor in play or PE? Are there breaks? Is there non-screen time? Um, low-tech activities, things like that, and then uh, reading as a priority. So uh, those are some resource attributes, of course. 
Uh, and so we encourage you to take a look at this if this is helpful. Um, and it links out to different districts. We have uh, mostly districts from across Texas, but also some uh, national examples, DC Public Schools, Khan Academy. Um, and then also we, we try to make sure we have at least a couple smaller districts in here. So Rio Hondo, uh, Rosebud Lot um, have some good examples, uh, SCU, um, ISD. Um, so this is the, again, the 3.1 at home learning schedules matrix. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that if, if it looks like it would be helpful. Um, the second thing I want to highlight under TEA resources for the scheduling um, is this uh, at home learning master schedule template, or I'm sorry, not that one. It was the elementary scheduling template and the middle school and high school scheduling template. Um, and so these two here um, help us uh, give, get templates for creating a schedule. Um, so let me pop over really quick to the middle and high school one in the interest of time. Um, and so what this does is this has created uh, kind of a set of four different options uh, here. This is a uh, middle school teacher-led schedule, a middle school student-led schedule, and then high school schedules for both of those as well. Um, again, when we're saying middle school teacher-led, we're thinking more on the synchronous side of things, so where your all students would be going to this, through the same material at the same time throughout the day. A student-led is more, this is the number of minutes that the student should be doing on each subject. Um, but they can do it at, at whatever point throughout the day. Um, and so uh, let me just walk through this real quick. Uh, one quick caveat for any of these resources that you see on the website. These are meant to be resources and examples for you to use as you see most fit. Uh, we included them, excuse me, in Word as much as possible so you can adapt and adjust as, as much as necessary. This is not in no way meant to be a, a prescription of how you should be doing it if you have a better way or, or a different way to, that makes more sense for your district. Um, by all means, you should be doing it that way. Um, so templates, uh, middle school teacher-led schedule, you'll see uh, more prescriptive about the amount of time that they're spending and, and what they're doing. Um, for the templates in 3.1 and 3.2, any of the text in orange is meant to be kind of replaced by what makes most sense for your district, depending on your instructional model as well as the instructional materials that you're using. Um, so that's an example for a teacher-led. And then on the more student-led side of things, um, we're talking through kind of a more minutes per day for subject. And so this would outline um, a schedule for students and families that gives them an idea of how much time they should be spending, but then still directs them to whatever delivery platform for the days, the specific days assignment that you have, um, so they can still um, reference kind of the daily actions. Um, we also have an opportunity here for exit tickets um, and, and making sure that uh, student mastery is, is uh, captured in, in some facet in whatever way you see most of it there. Um, and then we have a couple other examples here for high school that are similar. Um, encourage you to take a look at that and, and consider that um, as appropriate. Okay. Um, additionally, for, for at-home learning schedules here, um, for your additional resources, these are resources that were linked out to other um, external organizations. We have recommendations on child media use. Um, Instruction Partners has a great uh, sample schedule um, on their website. IXL has an option, and then um, as many of you I'm sure know, Khan Academy has some good options as well. Uh, and then district created examples here. Um, this is similar to that, uh, the matrix document, um, but if you wanna click straight to some of those district examples, you can find that here. Um, and uh, just a variety of, of examples on this site. Uh, one thing I do wanna highlight, I, I saw yesterday or the day before on Rosebud Lot ISD's um, schedule, they have, have um, been creative with building engagement um, for their students and have outlined their activities as kind of a, a bingo card for their elementary students, which I thought was a great way to um, help build in student engagement at a time when we have more limited access to um, redirections and things like that. Um, those are some of the resources, but I encourage you to click in and out of, of some of the scheduling resources here as appropriate. Um, and then we also have you know, additional TEA options here. Um, 
So uh, take a look at those. Let's go ahead and move on to 3.2, um, and this is adapt staffing models. Um, so again, we'll start with the, uh, the guidance documents. Um, so 3.2 adapt staffing models guidance documents. Um, let me open it up. If you click on that link there on the left, that would take you directly to this Word document that I'm about to open up here. Okay. Um, and so similarly structured, this will give us a couple planning activities, some planning guidance. Um, and so our main activities here for, for staffing is identify your staffing plan needs um, based on kind of the work that you've done over the past couple days or, or that you would have done uh, in phases one and two uh, in determining your instructional model as well as your access to instructional materials and, and um, all of that. And then update your roles and responsibilities for all school and district level positions um, to adjust to this new normal and make sure that, that everyone is clear on uh, what they should be doing. Uh, so some of the guiding principles here, um, so set high expectations for staff and students. So just because we are all remote does not mean uh, we need to lower expectations. Uh, clarity, again, is key. Um, making sure that everyone is very clear on, on what they uh, are responsible for or, and or not responsible for uh, is helpful. And then again, don't recreate the, the, the wheel. There are some examples out there um, to reference and, and more and more guidance is, is being posted every day um, to really look at some of those staffing models, especially within the context of roles and responsibilities. Uh, five steps that we've outlined here. So um, identify and communicate point people, uh, clearly communicate teacher roles and responsibilities, um, continue your weekly check-ins and professional learning communities uh, as much as possible. Um, this is especially helpful in times when everyone is kind of going through a different type of instructional delivery. Um, set up daily contact between staff and students, uh, and then uh, monitor student progress. Uh, then down here again, we have uh, kind of our TEA resources, additional resources, and district create ex created examples. Those are linked more directly on our website. So let's pop back over there. Um, so again, we are um, on the instructional continuity framework, phase three. Uh, and then if we scroll down, we can get to 3.2. Um, this second column here are TEA created resources around staffing models. Um, and so the first thing I want to highlight is the uh, staffing models matrix. This is similar to the schedules matrix that we just looked at. Um, and so let me pop over to that. Um, and so similarly, we have um, our source over here where we, we have the document from, what the actual example is, a link out to that document, a description of why that would be relevant here, um, and then some of the key attributes that we have for that resource. Um, and so things like uh, incorporating PLCs, if they've factored in um, special populations, uh, student progress monitoring, um, teacher direct instruction, how they've, they have accounted for that and outlined that within their roles and responsibilities. Um, if they have an office hour requirement, which just about everyone does um, within these examples, um, if they have video conferencing with students and how, and so you could reference those for um, sample language on how they are guiding their, their staff around that. Uh, ongoing communication with students and families, if they have a communications log for conversation, um, and then details on lesson planning and grading and providing feedback on assignments. Um, so this is meant again, like if you are looking for uh, an example where you need um, you're not quite sure how to phrase something around what your expectation is for staff around lesson planning. Um, you can say, okay, great. looks like Alamo Heights might have something. Uh, you can click on the link and then go there. Um, so again, we have a couple examples from Texas and a couple national examples. And um, we'll continue working on updating this for the next uh, couple days uh, to make it as relevant as possible. Um, the second thing that I would love to show you on for 3.2, um, a lot of this, uh, the staffing models overlaps very well with some of the more just staffing questions in general and FAQs. Um, and so 
we have included um, a direct link to the guidance on educator and staff issues um, and educator evaluations and non-renewal here, um, which is, a, I believe, a four-page FAQ document. Um, additionally, I do want to highlight on the coronavirus page at TEA's website, um, which is basically back one page here, or two pages. But on the coronavirus page, if I type in coronavirus, tea.texas.gov slash coronavirus, I can scroll down uh, towards the bottom, and there's a staff and educator issues section here. And these documents are great resources for some of the FAQs that are popping up around um, things related to staffing and, and uh, educator support. Um, so I wanted to highlight that option as a, a very directly relatable um, uh, resource for 3.2. Now let's get back to um, phase three of the instructional continuity framework. Um, some additional resources here. So we have uh, an expectations template for at-home learning school-based staff. We'll also have a district-based staff one posted here soon. Um, that kind of walks through an example template of uh, different components that you might want to think through uh, in adapting to a more remote um, working life um, and, and what are the different expectations that you would have for, for your staff. For school-based staff, we have um, rows that include things like um, what you would want uh, your communications expectations to be. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that if you are still working on developing um, roles and responsibilities expectations for your staff. This next column for 3.2 uh, outlines some uh, TASB resources that are, that are very helpful around um, personnel issues and, and other um, things during uh, closures. I encourage you to take a look there. And then um, for district resources, um, again, we've, we've linked out to some of those mentioned in the matrix, the staffing models matrix here. Um, so Alamo Heights ISD, Garland, uh, Miami-Dade, um, all these would be worth taking a look at uh, to get an, an example of um, both how they are presenting as well as how are, they are just listing out responsibilities for um, district and school staff. Um, for for these different school systems. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to section 3.3. This is uh, communicate your plan to stakeholders. Um, and so to do so, I'm going to again start with uh, the guidance document real quick. So let me pop over there. To get to this guidance document, again, you would hover over 3.3 and, and click on the link. Um, but uh, some key considerations here. Um, so communications, of course, are, are critical to ensure that all stakeholders know what's going on um, and just know what the expectations are uh, for both the current and the future structure. Um, and so some tailored communications for each stakeholder help with concise and simple communications uh, and let those stakeholders know what action that they need to take. Some of the, the, the activities then create a communications plan um, communicate with teachers and then also with students and families. So making sure that you have uh, all your stakeholders uh, considered in your communications. Um, and then provide ongoing communications as updates and decisions are being made. Um, so centralized locations for those communications are, are helpful as well. Um, some of the guidance that we have for uh, your communications plan um, one is, is to create one in, in the first place. Uh, I'm gonna pop over to a template here in, an, in a minute. Um, one, next is, uh, again, communicate with those key stakeholders, and, and these are examples here of teachers and students and families. Um, you might also have subgroups of that that you need to target, um, but making sure that uh, all of those are, are factored in. Um, and then ongoing communications, so making sure that you have your follow-up and, and ensuring stakeholders are receiving that information. Um, so let's go ahead and pop over. Um, this is going to be posted soon under the TEA resources site or, or TEA resources column. Um, so to find this, um, you would go, so 3.3 here, communicate plan for stakeholders under the TEA resources column. Um, this will be posted today, um, and uh, this is the, um, let me pop over and make sure I get the title right here, um, 
a template for district crisis communications. Um, and so this is uh, just a template for you to be able to walk through and, and kind of think through what your crisis communications can look like um, and kind of outlines different components such as the, the communications team who should be on it, um, how to get started, uh, and then breaks it down into four essential steps. Um, so a, a helpful way to kind of go through really developing your plan and making sure it's thought through and, and you've captured all of your stakeholders and um, communication channels appropriately. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at this document once it's posted. Um, it'll be posted on our website. Uh, I believe it will be today, if not within the coming couple hours. Um, and um, so a couple also just uh, message development op opportunities here, so templates. Um, and tips and guidance uh, for that messaging, and then also follow up. So um, take a look when that's posted, if it, if it looks relevant to you. Um, and then also want for communications, I also wanna highlight, um, we do have uh, some great op um, examples here from districts across the state. Um, one of these that uh, I'll click into is Spring Branch ISD. Um, and they've done a great job of really keeping all of their messaging in, in one place and uh, kind of hit on the clarity and, and simplicity that um, is helpful in, in times like this. Um, and so uh, this is their main coronavirus COVID-19 update page. And they have all of their messaging here on the same page, English and Spanish. And then a, a quick, you know, here's the main, um, what this, this message is going to cover. Uh, and an option to go cover it, to go, uh, excuse me, link out directly to that, that message. Um, so one example, we have uh, several other examples on this site um, from different districts across the state and, and how they are confronting um, communications. And then again, later today, we'll have that uh, crisis communications template posted on this website. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Melissa Lautenschlager, to talk through um, sections 3.4 and 3.5 here. Thanks, Brian. This is Melissa Lautenschlager. I also work in the um, school programs. And I wanted to talk to you today about two sections, 3.4, providing a model line professional development, and then 3.5, purchase, print, and distribute instructional materials. You can find the information I'm discussing on our COVID page, going to phase three here. I'm gonna click into this first component, which is on the guidance around providing model line professional development. Within this document, there, there is a focus to help support your thinking, but really the idea here is that shifting students, teachers, and leaders to an at-home learning model is challenging and it will require some specific training and support. Going through the steps of uh, thinking through your plan is going to be important to determine not only what tools you are going to be needing to use for this at-home learning model, but also the training and support that will need to be provided for your staff, students, and families. As part of this guidance, it's focused on three key, key activities. One is to create a training plan and timeline for by stakeholder group. The second is to identify training platform and design trainings for all stakeholders. And then lastly, executing trainings as decisions are made and information is available. Throughout this document, there are questions to help guide the thinking and then I'll direct you to some templates that can also help organize your thoughts as you're beginning your planning. The biggest thing to say here for this guidance is that you really should leverage currently purchased or regularly used tools and platforms to help provide greater continuity and consistency for your students and staff. Not trying to shift to all totally new um, programs and platforms will be really important and we'll talk through how to do that. 
I would start here with this guiding, guiding document to think through different questions associated with staff needs, options for training, how to execute, create and execute a plan, and then preparing for follow-up, which will be discussed in more detail in tomorrow's phase three. When you're beginning to think about your, your tools and designing a training, one thing to consider is utilizing the template for designing a training plan. This template is a Word document that can be edited. The purpose of this is to provide some guidance on questions to ask yourself about what current tools, programs, and platforms are being used within your district or campus and thinking about how those tools are being used, who's using them, and other training considerations before you begin to develop your training plan. You may have already done some training, have some individuals that can help to support. Underneath each of the questions, we've also provided some examples of a response to this thinking. After you've thought about the existing tools, a next step would be to think about what new digital tools, programs, and platforms you might need to leverage during this time. An example of this is thinking through how you're going to communicate with families or even within um, your professional staff. Having things like teacher collaborative meetings might need to utilize programs like Google Meets or Zoom. And in this case, really thinking about what you need for that tool, why and how you'll be using it, what are the expectations, who will be using the tool, and then begin to think about the training considerations. Going through this process will really help you to develop a strong plan for training that's needed for staff and families as well. Then once you've been able to identify what tools or new programs that you'll be utilizing or leveraging that already exist, then beginning to think about the specific trainings that are needed, who the stakeholder groups you'll need to identify and um, engage in this training. Then the types of trainings or resources that exist because there are lots and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. How you wanna prioritize, what are the most important tools and programs, platforms that you will use first and how do we bring those trainings um, to people? And then really thinking about how will you support the use of this uh, these tools moving forward. Will you engage your IT staff? Will you leverage leaders on campuses who are familiar? And again, examples are provided to help support. And then thinking week by week, what will be the trainings that are available and being very clear for who needs what, thinking through how to group stakeholders with a similar lens in order to provide very specific training. So this template is a, a, a resource that's optional. You can edit and utilize um, in the most appropriate way for your local context. Another resource that I think is helpful is this example conditions for determining tools, programs, and platforms. This particular resource is truly just examples of what you may want to think through when you're determining what you're going to need for at-home learning. In this particular case, thinking through how instruction will be delivered, this again is a Word document and you can edit as needed, but it's to provide the specific examples of thinking through types of tools that now might be needed for at-home learning. And then the other pieces that I wanted to share with you about aligning professional development is there are lots and lots of resources that are available to you to help to support. You do not have to create all of the trainings yourselves. So for example, um, there are some really great resources out there that are free webinars. One I suggest is this teaching special education online webinars. These are on-demand webinars um, produced by the Council for Exceptional Children. 
there are many different links to additional webinars, videos, and best practices. Moving to serve all students in a different platform can be really challenging. So I suggest looking at these training resources as you're thinking through your plans. Another resource that could be really helpful is just linking to things like Google for Education. This Google for Education provides trainings that have been pre-recorded, set up so that you can see many different, if you're utilizing Google um, documents, if you're using Google Meets, these trainings can help to support that work. Zoom is also has its own training center. So thinking about leveraging the programs that you're using, they are providing additional training. Another place I wanted to show you is in yesterday and the day before's webinar, we produced a new searchable database on the Texas Resource Review, where you're able to search at-home learning materials. I'm directing you here because not only can you search materials, but you can also look at what is being provided. Um, you can go through and look at what programs have you purchased from your district for different content areas and you're able to search here, look at content area, um, see if it's a free or paid capabilities. And another piece that you can find is when you go to one of the links, you'll be able to find some specific supports that help with training, both in what's available for family resources and what different publishers are, are going to be um, providing at this time. We have also created on our TA resources is this training database, which is an Excel spreadsheet. It is for the publishers that are on the adopted state list, and it just provides a simple format for you to identify what is the publisher, what subject area, what types of trainings are easily accessible and available, and their contact information. I encourage you to reach out to your publishers who you have purchased products because they are offering a lot of additional supports at this time. The last thing I wanted to draw your attention to in this category is an example from Garland ISD in which they have put together what types of trainings their teachers need and how their teachers will be receiving that training and what's required and what's available. I'm sure there are many other district examples that we would love to share on this page as well, so please send this, those toward us. I'm going to move on to the next section of 3.5, which is purchase, print, and or distribute instructional materials. Starting off with the guiding document, we know that not all families have digital access at this time and you may need to have some physical materials that are available for at-home learning. Going through and figuring out what who needs to have physical materials, thinking through what to use and how to get those to our families are going to be really important questions at, these time, at this time. Using this guiding document, it's split into five categories where you're identifying the list of needed printed materials, creating a plan for delivery, what might need to be purchased or printed, how to oversee logistics, and creating an inventory and tracking system. Throughout the document, you will see some guiding questions that help to support the thinking in each of these categories. Um, for this particular area, you really should try to reach out to your publishers and leverage what they might be um, providing in addition to the normal resources. With the current situation, it may not be possible for you to have distribution centers or people coming up to schools to print. Contacting your publisher and seeing if they provide a direct delivery to homes at this time is a great way to leverage your already established partnership, and they are helping to provide additional print resources in many cases. So contacting your publisher directly is a great idea. 
other resources to support your considerations for purchase, print, and distribute of instructional materials are a couple things. First, we have this logistical considerations listed on our website. It really talks through the safety considerations as you're developing a plan. If you're going to do a distribution model, um, maybe at some of your meal site pickups. There are also other um, considerations about talking to local printing shops, um, looking at FedEx or UPS, and we're going to continue to add resources on who you might be able to contact in regards to printing and shipping directly to families. At this time, you're, you can request um, reimbursement for print materials. In the past, paper had not been part of this, but we have expanded that to include paper for request, um, a request reimbursement for your instructional materials allotment funding. The other piece that I wanted to share with you is this template for purchase, print, and distribution. This template helps to think through the considerations about what you already have for particular grades and course courses. Will there be workbooks that you could leverage and distribute? Could you contact your publisher and have them send out materials? What additional materials will you need printed? who's going to need those materials and really identifying them with families. And then notes about, um, are your publishers providing additional, what alternative products are available that are free? There are many, many free resources. And then within this template are provided examples for each to help um, illustrate the different questions that are being asked. Here are some different creating a plan thinking through how materials will get from deciding what to use all the way to being distributed to families. So taking this template and editing it to meet your local context is um, suggested. There are some additional pieces on instruction partners where it's a toolkit for guiding. We would really like to see what other District, what our districts are doing as far as thinking through purchase, print, and distribute. So please send our way so we can post some district examples. We know you are deeply thinking about this and how to get it to students. Um, at this time, I'm gonna pause and push back over to Brian so that he can answer some questions. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, so we'll start talking through some of the questions here. Um, first question is just kind of recognizing that um, uh, there's an opportunity for, for including more uh, intervention uh, examples within some of these resources. Um, definitely um, agree with that and, and we'll continue working on revamping these and, and identifying um, district examples as much as we can. Um, Brian, so yeah, yes. Yeah, also reminding people that on our COVID page at the beginning, there is a special education component if we go back. Right. And there's a lot of information here to help support with um, students needing additional supports. Great. Thanks. Um, excellent. So, next question. Um, is uh, how can we submit our at-home learning protocol? Um, so uh, just a quick clarification here, um, all of the tools and resources that we've covered today and templates, these are for your own use and for your ability at your district uh, to consider things that are being done across the state. These are meant as resources and we don't need them submitted to us um, in, in that sense. And so um, if that's where that question was leading, um, we don't need a submission. Um, if you are asking more on the lines of like, hey, I have a great example of something that uh, I'd love to share for others as well, um, you can send that to disasterinfo at tea.texas.gov. And we'll type that in the chat here in a second. Um, the next question um, is a, a more credit-based question for high school students. Uh, this is a great question. Um, we will be covering this more um, in our webinar tomorrow, I believe, on phase four on um, 
the uh, kind of monitoring side of things. Um, so I encourage you, I don't have the exact answer for you today, but I encourage you to, to clue in tomorrow, as well as explore some of the resources on phase four there. Um, if any of the, of the other panelists on have a more uh, exact answer for that, feel free to chime in. And we also discussed, um, you can find that in phase three, there, um, excuse me, on phase 2.2 2 yesterday, um, they discussed some about grading credit and graduation plans. And so I would access those resources on phase two as well. I'll show you where those are. Great. All located right here, some guidance and continue to send in questions. And tomorrow there'll be additional about progress monitoring. Great, great. Thank you. Um, next question, is there a sample schedule for children in a home sharing just one device? Um, so we don't have an, a, it down to maybe that explicit level. Um, we do have in that initial matrix that we shared of um, learning schedules, we did try to identify kind of level of technology required for the each schedule. Um, so we did have a low tech option that is um, on the low end of examples in terms of what we have for our district examples. And so there might be one or two in there right now, um, but we'll be looking to continue to add to that as, as well. Um, so a lot of the packet pickup are, are gonna be um, some of the packet pickup options where you have more uh, print-based um, options are, are some of the solutions around that that we've seen. Um, and so are, are still working on collecting some of the more explicit schedules around that. There's a question here about getting work returned from students as a concern. I think this can be really challenging. Um, at, you can do some like self-addressed envelopes and there's some guidance in our, our documents about those considerations, both for pickup and distribution found here, for example, considerations. I think things to think about is, um, is, is there an opportunity to hold on to that, to have students both um, send pictures, if that's an option, and then also considerations about um, contact with their teacher and walking through some of the questions so that you're able to um, look at or talk through the student work. Um, we'll send some more, we'll think about some more guidance and be able to give some more examples, but we'd also love to hear from districts as well as what they're doing as far as getting back returned work. Um, question here for adult learning. Um, so on accepting proof of adult learners teaching their own children um, as evidence of mastery of that concept and skill, I think that's a, a excellent way to go about that. Um, so. Uh, kind of a more unique um, situation there, but but definitely something that, that makes sense. Um, are there provisions in place for parents who refuse to allow their child to participate in at-home learning? Um, at this point, I'm not aware of, of uh, any guidance that we've put out around that. Um, and again, other panelists, if, you, if you're aware of something, please feel free to correct me here. But um, I be, be on the lookout for something, but uh, at this point, I, I don't know that we have any specific guidance around that other than um, you know, working on, on communications and, and messaging as much as possible um, with the awareness that uh, every situation is different, of course. There was a question about hacking from outside. I do know that some of the programs are beginning to consider this. Zoom, um, I've read some things about Zoom putting out where you have to request entry into a, into a session. Um, so we'll look more into that to make sure to help provide some guidance. If we weren't, some of these questions we may not be able to answer 
during this time and we will be providing some additional responses later um, if we weren't able to answer your question. I see some things in the chat specifically about Zoom and that there is a waiting room where the host has to allow you to enter. So that's a, um, an interesting thing to pursue if you're looking for holding online classes with students. Definitely a concern about, we understand privacy considerations. Um, there won't be any specific data that would be um, compromised. We wouldn't be recommending anything on any plans that we put out. We do encourage people to look into what they're asking their students and families to use if they're selecting new tools and programs to make sure that students are protected. Oh, question about ESCs. I, you should work with your partner ESC in your region. Many of them have moved to this remote support and digital learning sessions. I encourage you to look at, we put two examples from 20 and 11, but I'm sure there are many more examples um, to look at your local ESC and reach out to them. Packet printing reimbursement. You submit just like a request for reimbursement for any type of instructional material. Our EMAT is down um, for a few weeks as we put up the new materials for next year. Hold on to that and you may submit reimbursements um, beginning at the beginning of May. And you can also reach out to me, Melissa Lautenschlager, um, if you have additional questions regarding printing and to our um, disaster email. A quick question for the regional centers if, um, who are offering live webinars, if they're going to be open to anyone in the state or only in the region. Uh, that's likely going to depend on on each regional center. So I know um, some of them have been public to everyone. Um, for example, Region 4 has a lot of resources and some webinars that have been public to everyone. Um, but there might be situations where other regions um, are keeping that to their own uh, districts. I believe one of the questions is asking where the instructional materials are. There's two places. If you go to um, texasresourcereview.org, you can, this site will bring you right to home learning resources. You can find some information regarding accessibility and um, particular information about um, products that you may have purchased. The other is on our website for trainings with our training database that might also provide you some information about trainings. Okay, we have a couple other questions that we'll look at getting to um, in an FAQ document. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if you have any last questions, um, please pop them in right now. But uh, we're going to go ahead and probably end the webinar here in, in a minute or two. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, another plug for the phase four webinar tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. 
Um, we'll be talking through more of that monitoring, sorry for the garbage truck in the background. Um, but I uh, encourage you to, to uh, attend that one as well or, or have someone at your district attend. Um, so with that, um, thank you. And then we'll have this recording up on the website uh, later today as well. Thanks.